Trisha Calvaries is running for Colorado's 4th Congressional District, and she's running against Congresswoman Lauren Boebert, who poses a significant threat to democracy, not just in Colorado, but across the country. Welcome back to our Candidate Q&A series. I'm Courtney Cohn. Let's get started. All right, welcome, Trisha Calvaries. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you so much, Courtney. But, but first things first, if you're going to say my name right, you got to mm-hmm. use your hands because it's Italian, so you have to Calvaries. Because folks always ask me how you pronounce it. You just yeah. say it with your hands. So. Uh, amazing. Okay. Future <laughs> reference, I will. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. So just yeah. to start, um, can you tell me why you're running for Colorado's 4th District in Congress? Yeah. I'm running to make it easier for everybody to take care of and to spend time with the ones they love. Um, you know, to drive down costs and to get rid of corruption. I'm a daughter of this district. Went born and raised through and through, went to the public schools, earned a full academic scholarship to an amazing school to Johns Hopkins. And, you know, I was at the AFL-CIO at a very exciting time and then in government at the National Science Foundation when life happened. You know, if you live long enough, if you're lucky to live long enough, somebody you know will get sick and you're going to have to deal with end of life care. And for me, it happened for both of my parents at the same time. They both had cancer and I'm an only child. So thank goodness for my union, AFGE 3403, shout out, um, and Medicare, I was able to drop everything, move back home, and provide that end-of-life care for my parents at home. So I have a very firsthand knowledge of of the system, of all the pieces that are missing, that never were, that are frankly inhumane. And, um, you know, so that's, there's this one moment, I'll, I'll, you know, if you want to get into it, I'll tell you this moment where I knew I was going to spend the rest of my life fighting for care in some way or form, but really what inspired me to step up and run for Congress was my dad. Um, He was a lifelong Republican, okay? Like this guy had an identity crisis when he found out he was only 98% Italian American. Like very like old school, you know, Republican. He told me, listen, you need to step up, even if you're, you know, a Democrat, that was my great rebellion, and you need to run to serve the community that has invested so much in you, it's time for you to return it. So that's, I made up my mind and that's exactly what I'm doing. Yeah. And can you, you know, talk about how you'd like to protect democracy in Colorado and in the country in general, because I really appreciate you sharing your story and how you got here, but I'd love to know what you'd like to do moving forward. Yeah. Democracy, I mean, is, is really on the ballot box. It's, that's, on, that's on the ballot, every single ballot in America. And it's not just at the ballot box. It's also in our workplaces, right, where you should have a voice on the job and to say, and that means restoring our union rights. So making sure that we're electing those pro-democracy candidates up and down the ballot uh, for, for results, not only with voting rights, which that is so important, uh, but it, democracy is a, is a big issue writ large. Yes, democracy is certainly a big issue, and you're right, it is on the docket this November. Now, you know, speaking of this upcoming election, of course, can you talk about what your strategy is running against your Republican opponent, Lauren Boebert, who already has, you know, a strong MAGA base and has already served a term in the House? Yeah, absolutely. We're, we are just, we're engaging folks wherever they are all throughout the district. We're making it very clear that we're running to put people over politics. And we're inviting, we're hearing from independents and even Republicans as well as Democrats. We're engaging folks across the board who want reform, who are ready to get rid of corruption in our politics, like who ready to enforce things like term limits, make sure that dark, dark money is not having such a big role as it is right now, frankly. So we're really seeing such like grassroots momentum behind this campaign from not only Democrats, but independents and Republicans as well. And that's so exciting. Right, definitely. And in terms of, you know, getting Republican and independent support as well, I think it's important to look at what Lauren Boebert has done in Congress, along with the other Republicans. She has uh, opposed a voting rights bill, the For the People Act. So can you talk about, you know, what impact, you know, this has on a legislative level and what you would do differently in this position? Yeah, it's not what she's doing. It's what she's not doing. It's what she's preventing. And what I'm really concerned about, I mean, come on, people don't need another barrier to vote. Life is hard enough. People are busy. They got things to do. They've taken care of our kids, our families. Don't make it harder to play political games, right? You can, you can see what they're doing. They're setting the table to already say that there's some kind of big, you know, conspiracy of undocu- undocumented people are afraid to come out of the shadow economy. That's part of the problem. 
right? And that hurts all working people. So there's certainly, I don't think, voting in mass as, as Lauren Boebert is claiming. So that's, you already see they're setting it up to kind of sow seeds of, dis, you know, disinformation and doubt uh, in the district, but people are engaging. That's, there is, there is no better antidote than the reality of knocking on doors, talking face-to-face -to, -face to voters, engaging them, handshaking them, and meeting them where they are. So that's exactly what we're doing. So I would 100% support voting rights reform. You better believe it. Definitely. And something that's been mentioned a lot in voting rights reform is reducing voter intimidation and any tactics that people employ to cause that. Um, so I wanted to ask you about a Colorado case in 2022. Um, people filed a lawsuit basically explaining that this right wing group, um, the United States Election Integrity Plan, was intimidating voters. And ultimately, the case got tossed because the judge said there wasn't enough evidence. But can you talk about what the impacts of that case and similar cases are for Colorado voters? Well, Courtney, I can promise you on my campaign, we're going to be hitting those doors twice as hard to engage people, to make sure that we are meeting them wherever they are all throughout our district. Because that's the opposite of democracy, is to intimidate people. You got to win on the idea of your merit, even if you disagree with people. That's what democracy is about. We are a plurality of voices. So intimidation is the most anti-democratic thing I can think of. And I think the anecdote to that is democracy, is exercising those rights like free speech, knocking on our door, engaging with our neighbors. And you know what? We're finding a lot more community than the, than the divisiveness that, that Lauren Boebert wants you to believe is, is writ large. Like, no, there is more community here. Folks, folks are worried about the future and they want somebody who's going to be there for them. So that's, that's exactly what we're doing, Courtney, engaging it uh, on, a, on a grassroots level. Yes. And you mentioned this issue of divisiveness among voters in Colorado, but also across the country. Can you talk about how you hope to kind of bring people together among this time of divide? So my mom, okay, my best friend, like I was her only child. She was a Trump supporter. She grew up in Dixon City, Pennsylvania. She never had access to college. I was the first in the direct maternal line to go to college. And we would have the best debates, right? Because like there would, you know, there's common ground where you can find that common ground of, hey, it's not working for you, and it hasn't for a really long time. And I get that, regardless of your party, regardless of the politics. Let's, let's send somebody in there who's actually going to try to fix it. People want good jobs. They want good opportunities. Uh, like I said, I'm from this community, too. So I went to these amazing public schools. We want to keep them amazing. We want to also adapt for the future, right? This is the AI era. We need somebody who's really going to be getting us forward, not taking us backwards. Now, speaking of the AI era, and this kind of goes back to what we were talking about, about threats to elections, uh, what, you know, what can be done about these AI threats, you know, whether that's these deep fakes or, you know, other people pretending to be candidates, giving election misinformation. How do you think we can fight against that? And, and what's the strategy there? That's an excellent question, Courtney. And I like this is such an exciting conversation because it's not happening and it needs to happen more. We need to get in front of the problem. I think that there were some pieces of legislation that were moving. Honestly, in my opinion, I think they were a little bit too blanket. I think we need to like tailor make it a little bit, but we got to get ahead of this. Especially, I mean, this not only applies to our um, election integrity, this is an issue writ large. So we need folks who are thinking about these issues, like understanding them, they're seeing how it's impacting the workforce, and they're getting ahead of it. And they're going to Washington, D.C. to go try to fix it. I mean, these are not easy things to do. It's, it's easy to blow things up, right? It, it takes a lot of effort to try to build even when you disagree with people. But that's, that's what I'm here to do. Definitely. And can you, you know, in addition to the things you've already brought up in terms of voting rights and democracy, can you talk about what your other priorities are in Congress? Yeah, absolutely. Um, restoring freedom. Because, you know, Lauren, exactly like you pointed out, Lauren Boebert voted against cancer care for veterans. OK, and she said, your health care isn't my job. Keeping you healthy isn't my job. Yet she thinks she has any business at all in my health care decisions. And I'll tell you what, Courtney, we need to go further than just restoring our rights. We need to extend, expand maternal health care. So the year before I was born, mom and dad were living in rural Sterling, Colorado. Mom had an ectopic pregnancy. It was an absolute emergency. So they removed it, saved her life, and made mine possible the next year. We are seeing right now in Texas 
that women who are having ectopic pregnancy emergencies be turned away from care. That is unconscionable. It is unacceptable. And I am going to running to Congress and I will do everything I can to stop that, to prevent it and to expand maternal care. Finally, because we ultimately we left Sterling. We moved to the suburbs to be closer to Denver, to be closer to care. That's these communities have been drained of resources for so long, have been left behind, divested. And we need people who believe in them. I believe in them. And that's that's what I'm running for. Yes. And so, you know, you talked about your upbringing, growing up in a rural community. Can you talk about how you'll use kind of that experience, your diverse life experience to help appeal to all voters, you know, rural, urban, suburban voters on all issues, including voting rights and democracy? Absolutely. It comes down to care and opportunity. Honestly, care and opportunity. And, you know, living in rural places before, it's you see it over and over again. These young folks who are like, I was, you know, pursuing my dreams and I, you know, had moved away, but I came back. And it's like, well, why? For so many reasons, same reason I did, because of care. I never even wanted to necessarily leave home, but that's where my opportunity was, right? It was on the coast. There is no traditional four-year university in my entire district, even though we have 21 counties. So it's about making those pathways accessible, meeting people wherever they are, and that don't even necessarily require a four-year degree. I am so thrilled to be endorsed by the Colorado AFL-CIO. I'm going to fight tooth and nail to bring the trades, to bring those skilled pathways to more places in traditional trades and industries of the future. There's so much potential here. We got big problems, but there's there's big opportunity if we have the right people willing to step up to roll up their sleeves and get some work done. Yes. And speaking of jobs, there has been kind of across the country, the shortage of poll workers and election officials. Um, and obviously, this is an extremely important job to make sure the races are run smoothly. So can you talk about what you think you know should be done about that and how to bring more poll workers in? I mean, we need to pass legislation that guarantees protection for poll workers. I mean, and it's a job like they people should be compensated and protected. That is one of the most, I think, sacred things you can do. And I think like more young people should be encouraged to be poll watchers to help understand the way, you know, it, the way it works, um, our democracy. And um, yeah, absolutely. We, we need to reform that. Definitely. And, you know, you talked about those kind of protections that people should have and, you know, trying to encourage more young people. But, you know, I think a conversation has had that, you know, a lot of people may not understand how elections work or understand how voting works in a lot of ways. And so, you know, do you think that there needs to be more education and information spread around voting and elections? Absolutely. I mean, and this is kind of like the other side of the coin of protecting us against AI disinformation. Because there was, you know, there was a deep, and it's really wild how quickly the AI is even evolving. Like there was a deep fake of President Biden earlier in the campaign cycle with, it feels like 500 years in campaign time, but where it is now, it, you can even see the technology has maybe even jumped from where it was a couple months ago. It's wild. So protecting us from that, from those deep fakes, but exactly like you were saying, we need to go further than that to guarantee that, th that we have... Um, that our poll watchers are safe, that are that there's a absolutely no intimidation. I mean, in basic things like banning firearms from polling locations, legislation, it's time to pass legislation and to work with the other side to get it done, right? They're so worried about it. Let's let's work on a bipartisan basis then and get something done for real, not come up with these imaginary problems for headlines. Yes. And speaking of bipartisanship, you know, obviously that's a big struggle right now in Congress, in both houses, even at the state level as well. So can you talk about how you'll, you know, work to push this goal of bipartisanship and get things done despite this deep partisan divide? Well, I do want to point to the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment Act, which was historic and bipartisan. And there's so much potential for that as well as the Bipartisan Chips and Science Act. And that's that one folks probably don't know about as well. The Chips and Science Act is one of the biggest workforce investments that we've had in a generation. We are reshoring American innovation, we're reshoring our manufacturing, and it equals good jobs. So that's no wonder it had a bipartisan uh, support. So more of those pieces of where we can agree, because I think that there are values that unite us. Folks want to be able to take care of their family. They want to be able to put food on the table. And people should be able to, if you work hard, you can support that family and retire with dignity. You know, we, we've kind of run the gamut here of voting rights and election questions. So I want to end this kind of on a fun, light note. So you mentioned that you grew up in a rural area. I noticed on your website, you said you grew up in an area with rural, you know, 
environment with wild horses. So I wanted to ask you what your favorite part of growing up in that area was, if you have any experience riding horses, things like that. Okay. Actually, it's Daniels Park. So it's protected and there are buffalo. So these are the same herd of buffalo like I grew up with. Like I'm sure some of the calves are now, you know, my age and like buffalo age. And just to see that like we've protected that, that those buffalo are still there. There's a lot of development. I mean, that's just kind of a like the, the you know, the pace of development has been stunning. I'm 37. And like there's entire towns and municipalities that were just dirt roads. So it's really given me, I think, the length of perspective that you need to legislate, to think, okay, and we're anticipating how many more millions of people who are coming here and are growing, and how do we do that sustainably? Because there's no reason we can't. The technology is here. We have the, we have so much exciting, like, energy from the young people. I just want to emphasize, because I'm a daughter of this district, right? And I've come back, and just the fact that this community is behind me means the world. And I want to support now our, our, the next gen of young people to solve those problems for the next decades of growth. I'm so excited. So Courtney, yeah, thank you. That's a great one. That's a great one. Yes. And I, one more thing I just want to touch on just based on something yes. you said, you mentioned that you grew up in this district, you know, you have a deep connection to it. And so, you know, I wanted to ask you, Lauren Bober, notably moved to this district to run. She switched districts essentially. So can you talk about what impact that has and and what voters should, how they can wrap their minds around that? Well, I mean, there was so much confusion, right? Of like, wait a second. Like, so she cherry picked, she abandoned her people and she thinks she's going to run here. It, people do not like it. I'll tell you that they don't, they don't want to be cherry picked. And what's so lovely kind of about their, their protest is they're worried about folks in Colorado three. They're worried about, well, who's representing them? So it's, it's had a huge impact. And I got to tell you, getting, getting emails from my like AP chemistry teacher, like for, you know, once you're like, oh my gosh, there's no test. I'm okay. Like it's, it's so exciting um, and just very uplifting. And it's that and it's, we can put community over division. We absolutely can community over division. Right. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today at Democracy Docket. You're awesome. Thank you, Courtney. And can I just say thank you for what you're doing? Like this is so, it's so important. And I'm just so glad you're here and that we're all here and let's go guys. We can do this. Let's go. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank Thank you so much for watching. If you want daily updates on all things voting rights and democracy, subscribe to our free newsletters now. I'll see you next time.